I hit record. So you, um, you are. Right, I'm, I'm going to attempt to share a screen. Okay. All right. Can everybody see this? I can. You can't? I can, yes. Faith's, oh, oh. Faith, yeah. Miss Huron. Gotcha. Yeah. Faith's modern too. All right. So I'm going to assume everybody can, can see it. So this is a presentation on the tragedy of Macbeth. It's also known as the Scottish play, which I'll, I'll uh, get into that later. So this is a brief presentation. I don't know if it's going to be brief, but here we go. But, uh, sorry, haven't. Okay, there we go. All right. So, as we've discussed before on in this class, William Shakespeare, uh, he was born born presumably in April twenty six. The reason being that he was baptized the uh, date of his uh, christening. So they so most scholars will say it was around. Uh, April 26 was the day he was born. He was born in Stratford upon Avon. Did I pronounce that right? Avon. Like, like Avon. Uh, yeah. Avon. Thank you. Uh, he died in that same place three days before his 53rd birthday. I just thought that'd be interesting to note. He's uh, often considered the greatest playwright in the English language probably the greatest writer in the English language. He wrote dozens of plays and over a hundred sonnets. One of the plays he wrote is Macbeth, which we'll discuss later. And uh, one other thing of note is that uh, at the time that Macbeth was made, King James I was the patron of the acting company. In case you don't know who King James is, he was a... Uh, he became king from a uh, Scottish Scottish lineage, which you know, kind of a kind of a thing going on. It's 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 a play about Scotland and and King James comes from Scotland, so there's that. Okay, moving on to a brief synopsis. So in the play, there is a it starts with a uh, thane whose name is. Uh, Oh, whoops, did I miss something up there? Yeah, just go back to your slide. There you go. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, there is a there's a thane named Macbeth who meets three witches who tell him that he's destined to be king of Scotland. After hearing about this prophecy, Lady Macbeth, Macbeth's wife, obviously, convinces him to murder King Duncan in order to secure the throne. After doing so, Macbeth becomes very paranoid and tries to kill anyone who threatens his threatens his reign, either through prophecy or just, you know, basic paranoia. Eventually, the citizens get tired of this of his tyrannical rule and they rebel against him. During the battle, Lady Macbeth commits suicide, presumably commits suicide, and Macbeth dies fighting off Macduff, which is, who is the you would consider the antagonist technically, but you would consider like the good guy of the play. After this, the rightful heir Malcolm is placed on the throne. So here's some sources, possible sources of inspiration. First is loosely based off of Scottish history. There was a person, there was a king named Macbeth, and there was a king named King Duncan. However, it's very loosely adapt adapted, like uh, the uh, real Macbeth wasn't a tyrant as the as the uh, play portrays him. It's mostly based off of uh, a, uh, a, a, ver a a historical account, which I can't remember the name of it right now. But it is it's based off of one of his contemporaries who gave a loose history of Scotland, which also happened to involve three witches giving a prophecy, which also. Anyway, throughout the play, there are also various references to King James. One thing to note is that, uh, is that uh, Macbeth kind of parallels uh, King James a little bit. 
So I wouldn't say that this is intentional, but but it does kind of resemble. It's a Scot. It's a uh, Scottish because there are some people who are concerned about uh, King James's rule. Some would some were afraid that he would be more uh, tyrannical. I guess the best way to put it. So Macbeth is kind of like a loose adept. Might be an unintentional loose adaptation of that. And there's also one thing of note is Banico's bloodline. So according to some sources, the uh, character Banico, who was a historical figure, is actually a is actually an ancestor of King James. So the reason it being in the play was as a, like a little compliment to King James, because. Look at the bloodline. It's right there prophesied. And there's also the uh, presidents of witchcraft. At the time, King James was pushing, was was pushing uh, that uh, witchcraft was was really bad and super dangerous, and and that's why it's in the play. There's also a potential reference to an event in history known as the Gunpowder Plot. So for those who don't know what the gunpowder plot is, the gunpowder plot was an attempt by uh, Jesuit officials. They were trying to essentially overthrow the monarchy and replace it with a uh, Catholic monarch because of the, uh, because of the uh, persecution that was going on, be conflict between the Catholics and the Protestants at the time. So, so they tried to store up a bunch of gunpowder in the parliament building. And, and their plan was to set off the huge amount of kegs of gunpowder and then blow up all of parliament and then assassinate King James. But the plot failed and they all ended up being, being hung for treason. Yeah. So where the reference is, is there is a reference to someone being referred to as an equivocator. Equi at the time, Jesuits were very well known for a tactic known as equivocation, which is where you basically lie indirectly. You lie without directly lying. Basically, this is how, how it works. So if I were a car salesman, I would go up to someone and say, look at this car. It's seen many years of service. But what I neglect to mention is that it was previously in a car crash and it was recently repaired. That would be an example of Lying by equivocation. So let us move on to the themes. The biggest theme in this in this play is the dangers of ambition. Basically, the the uh, title character Macbeth has an ambition to to uh, become king to be, become king of Scotland, and uh, and uh, especially Lady Macbeth has this huge ambition to become become a king of Scott to to take the throne essentially so there is a theme of ambition there there's also a theme of the corruption of power how how uh, having so much power and can corrupt somebody and cause them to become paranoid which is our other theme here where uh where uh, power tends to corrupt, as the saying goes, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There's also the theme of regicide, the uh, killing of, of uh, nobles. Basically, at the time that this was made, there was a belief going, going along called the divine right of kings. Basically, the idea was that the, was that the monarch was was appoint, was directly appointed by God, and that to and that to defy such a ruler would be would be in would be being opposed to God. So basically, if someone go, walks up and kills the king, it would be considered sacrilege to do that. So there's a definite theme there. There's also the theme of witchcraft, as I've previously mentioned, witchcraft. At least from what I understand from the play, it tends to portray it very negatively. Like they're they're considered like organizers causing chaos, 
pretty much. So those are the themes I've observed from here. And here are some notable quotes. Uh, this quote, I act, the first quote, I uh, know I was reading through it and I thought, yeah, this is a really good uh, summary of what the play's about. It's uh, when uh, uh, Bar Barco, I, I, I forgot his, I forgot his name. I forget. Banquo. Banquo. Uh, Banquo says to Macbeth at one time, that the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray one, to betray in deepest conscience, consequence. Basically summing up the, the uh, pro, basically summing up that uh, Macbeth, not Macbeth's uh, ambition, which is uh, inspired by the prophecy, caused him to, caused him to, to betray his uh, moral code, and then later, you know, getting his head chopped off. And then uh, another note is, "What's done is done." This is. I think this is a fairly common quote today, so that's why I would mention it. And there's also there's also the uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow scene, which uh, which uh, I which I really enjoyed. So next, let's go on to the next one. This is not directly related to the play, but I just thought I'd mention it just for fun. So there is a superstition that. Uh, that there is a curse surrounding the surrounding the play of Macbeth. Basically, the superstition goes that if you say the name Macbeth in a theater or some or a similar place, that something really bad will happen because you said the word Macbeth. There are some examples of this that I'll mention. Uh, there is one of the most infamous ones is the Astor Place riot. Basically, there were two there were two actors who had this really bad rivalry. They were both Shakespearean actors, and they ended up causing a riot that killed about twenty two people. And guess what play they were playing at that at the time of that rivalry? They were both doing Macbeth. So, and there's also the uh, old Vic, the old Vic perform. Old Vic performance is also pretty notable. It's noted for its several accidents. A few ones I'll mention is that there was there was issues with the with the uh, Macbeth accidentally stabbing the Macduff the Macduff characters. There was also there was also an incident where one of the manager's dogs actually died during the rehearsal. I couldn't found I couldn't find out how. I just I just found that out. And also the manager died before the opening of Macbeth. And then years later, after, after that, there was another performance of Macbeth and that same manager had, had her uh, picture fallen off during that time. And there's also an actress named uh, Darren Winward. I, I, Winward, I think that's how it's pronounced. Uh, she didn't believe in this curse, so she, she kind of just shrugged it off. But when she did her performance, she decided to do the uh, late the Lady Macbeth scene where uh, she's uh, sleepwalking. She decided to do it with her with her eyes closed. She ended up falling off stage and falling 15 feet to the ground. Luckily, she 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 survived that, but you know, that's something ouch. And uh, there's also one that's fairly more recent. Yeah, if you if you're aware of the uh, the latest Oscars, you might know that uh, you might know of the infamous uh, Will Smith Will Smith slap. So before that happened, the the uh, Chris Rock was uh, congratulating Denzel Washington's uh, recent Macbeth film and ended up saying the word Macbeth <laughs> on the stage. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are some other examples, but those are the ones I, I just thought I'd note. And so we move on to the questions and I think that's where we're gonna, where we're gonna stop there. 
Very, very nice, Josh. She gave us some great context there to get us started. So very, very nice. All right. Thank you. So um, we'll leave his question. We'll leave his question up. Let's let's start with the bonus question. What do you guys think of that? The, the Scottish plea. Do you, you feel like that's a a superstition worth listening to after uh, after what Josh just just said? Should we pay attention to these superstitions? Like we we all have them in some respects. This is one that's pervaded the theater for almost five hundred years. So I'll go ahead and start since I'm since I'm the one present presenting the question. So for me, after researching this, I'm just gonna say that. Uh, it might just be one of those cases where uh, people are seeing patterns and things that aren't actually there, like uh, like uh, the uh, black cat thing, where uh, mm. if a black cat crosses your path, there's something really bad going to happen. But uh, as a person who owns several black cats, I can tell you that I've, I've crossed the path of several black cats, and so far, I'm still here standing. So... To me, I think it's just a case of people seeing uh, things that aren't really there, like just seeing a pattern in bad events that aren't actually, you know, existent. That's my thoughts on it. Yeah, you hear about this stuff all the time, not just in theater, but even in like sports, right? Like, so, like baseball players all have a bunch of like these superstitions about different things. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting about the. I, I loved your point about the Oscars last year, Josh. That uh, Chris Rock said Macbeth right before the right before the incident. Um, it makes perfect sense now that uh, now that you said it. Yeah, I thought I uh, I found that out during my research, and I'm like, yes, I'm using that. <laughs> What do the rest of you guys think? Is, is there value in these superstitions, or you guys think it's just a bunch of baloney? What do you think, Faith? Personally, I think it's baloney, mostly because all the actors that ever acted in a Macbeth play would have terrible things happen to them to the point where the play would be banned. Right, yeah, just think of how many times they say his name on on stage. Yeah, the, the one part about um, the lady walking off the stage and falling 15 feet to the ground, that part was, that part was a little uh, scary. It reminds me of the theater in, Southern, in Southern's theater. There's a big drop off from the stage to the ground. Kind of, it kind of made me think of that. Let's um, let's dive in before we get to Josh's specific questions. Let's let's always start like we always do with uh, uh, Josh. If you don't mind, uh, minimize that for now, and we'll get back to them in a minute. I'll have you share again in a minute. So you can just click stop your share. There we go. Sorry, I I, I couldn't tell you. Oh, you're fine. So um, yeah, this this play is this play is one of Shakespeare's later tragedies. Like I think this one came about after um, a bunch of his other famous ones. So Hamlet, uh, Romeo, King Lear, Othello. I think all those were written before Macbeth. I think Macbeth was kind of his last major tragedy. Then he moved on into what he called the romance plays, which were uh, The Tempest and um, Pericles, A Winter's Tale, 
So those were a couple of the, that's kind of what he moved into later in his career. Um, Macbeth has a similar plot to a lot of his other works. Um, if you guys, you guys ever are curious, Shakespeare wrote um, what we call four. He wrote two different tetralogies as far as a history as history plays. Tetralogy means pretty much like trilogies three, tetralogies four. So um, early in his career, he wrote um, Henry the Sixth, one, two, three. And then Richard III was the end of his tetralogy. Richard III is a very similar play to this. I was actually going to be in Richard III this summer. We got to uh, the day that um, performance was going to happen, and half the cast came down with COVID, so all of our work was for nothing. I'm pretty sure somebody said Macbeth on, on stage the day before our, our, our uh, show. But um, that was one of his great tetralogies. And then his other famous one was Henry the um, Four, or no, it starts with Richard the Second, Henry the Four, One and Two, and then Henry the Fifth. That's his other tetralogy. He wrote, he wrote those based on real historical events from the War of the Roses, the, the battles between the Yorks and uh, the Lancasters. Um, so all of that history kind of informs how the Tudor dynasty started with um, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. He wrote those really early in his career before the plays we studied. And this one, as Josh said, this one comes about because of King, King James. At this point, Elizabeth has already passed. King James VI of Scotland takes the throne and becomes King James I of, of England. This was the moment that England stopped being England. This, when, he, when James took over, this was the moment where England started referring to itself as the United Kingdom because uh, Ireland begs to differ, but uh, Scotland, Ireland, England, they all became the United Kingdom. Um, with James's ascension to the throne. James was able to ascend because Elizabeth did not have a, an heir. So um, that was something that pervaded a lot of the literature. Like there's all this worry that, about why she didn't have an heir. You guys might know King James the first from the King James translation of the Bible. King James the first commissioned this translation of the Bible, which he translated it, they was, it was translated over from Martin Luther's um, German translation. So, um, you know, what most Protestant churches use today, the King James came from, uh, came from the king himself. King James, just the King James is also known as being, it's kind of funny that Josh, that she talked about him, his book about witches, he wrote he wrote a real a lot of the stuff that way that he describes these witches it comes from straight Shakespeare took it straight from his book. Um, he wrote this book kind of starting hysteria about witches. But uh, James was also known as um, they, back then they didn't have sexual identities, right? Nobody said that they were gay. Or lesbian or bi or whatever. But Jane, they what they would call it back then was the sin of Sodom of Sodom. So uh, if you go back and read the Genesis story from the Bible, that's what happened to uh, Lot, right? Lot and his family, they moved to the city of Sodom. And um, like that was the great sin that pervaded the city. So James was a famous um, sodomite, I guess you could, that's probably the best way to put it. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that's an interesting bit of history, too. 
that's just a little bit of extra to add to what Josh gave us, which was Josh gave us a lot of good context. This is an interesting. This is the third Shakespeare play we studied in this class. You guys you got and the fourth Renaissance tragedy. So um, no, actually the fifth, we read Faustus too. So you guys all have a good grounding in the Renaissance after this class. But I wanted you guys to read this one for Halloween. I figured this would be a good Halloween play because of the, mostly because of the witches. Um, so, um, and the Scottish curse, the Scottish play curse, is, that's always fun. Let me, uh, let's go round table. Um, let's see what you guys thought of this one. So just general impressions. I don't, we'll, we'll kick off with that. And then we'll kind of try to move over into Josh's questions. Daryl, I'll start with you. Uh, you, gave, you gave your presentation on Hamlet. How did Macbeth stack up compared to Hamlet for you? I did like Macbeth, and I don't know if I liked it um, more than Hamlet, but I, I saw a lot of similarities showing up. And um, in our other class, one of the Canterbury Tales was about woods, and they um, were talking about poisoning the other one and all that. I, I, I got vibes of that mixed with Hamlet almost in, in, in this story. And I'm not sure why exactly, but, you know, both of them entailed killing a king. Both of them were about someone rising to power and the themes of betrayal throughout. I really did like it, but I do think that I liked Hamlet a bit more. I liked this one more than Twelfth Night. So you're definitely a tragedies man rather than a, rather than a comedy comedies man that's a good point Daryl uh, you talked to Daryl mentioned this from the Canterbury Tales from Geoffrey Chaucer great poem which a couple hundred years before Shakespeare Geoffrey Chaucer wrote a story called the Pardoner's Tale and um, the pardon pardoners in medieval medieval life they were Catholics who uh, tried to sell you indulgences like they, they would try to sell these indulgences to get you out of purgatory i think i told i think i talked to you guys about that and i talked about the reformation um, so that story is a great story about greed it's a morality play and now you might actually be suggesting that macbeth is a cautionary tale of sorts right? like a, a morality play Kind of like maybe like every man does. Would you go as far to say that? Um, I think to a certain extent. And while and while you're talking about that, I did remember a little bit more about the partner's tale and why I thought there was a similarity. Um, the wait, maybe I'm thinking of the wife of Bath's tale where there was a woman in the woods talking to them and telling them their their future. That sort of the vibes I got from it because Ian Macbeth, you know, have you have the lady in the woods who tells him that he's going to be king, and then the wife of Bath's tale, she tells him the answer to the the riddle he was trying to solve for a year. And um, you know, there is some caution there because he he knew his fortune, he knew what was going to come to him and what he had to avoid with the forest walking up to him, and that he could not be killed by a man born from a woman but because those both sound like he doesn't have to worry about anything he didn't worry and he should have been more cautious about that maybe things would have turned out a bit differently for him yeah this is a classic tale of a guy cracking his own self up based off of these uh prophecies so um yeah that don't That'll be interesting discussion to move into in a moment as far as like you feel like the witches were actually um, telling the future. Did they, do they have that ability? Ben, as always, you can uh, pipe in the, uh, in the box if your mic isn't working. Um, 
Kira, what about you? What did you make of this of Macbeth? I thought it was good. It was interesting. What uh, struck your curiosity about it? Um, probably when he like went into the forest and stuff like that. Uh, I thought that was. I don't know, I have like mixed feelings about it, but it definitely was like one of the things that interested me. Yeah, there's um you did Faustus. There's a there's some similarities even between those two, I would probably argue. Um, yeah, the, especially like this whole fate. The fate versus freedom, make your own decisions. I think both plays definitely have that theme um, in common. Yeah, we uh, we should probably sometime during this class. We also need to talk about the great lady Macbeth. One of the uh, uh, Savannah. Savannah, I'm going to call on you. Uh, what did you think about? especially Lady Macbeth. We got a good example of femininity with a duchess. Maybe this is a complete opposite vision of femininity with, with Lady Macbeth. Um, I figured you would be drawn to that character, so I, I figured I would uh, ask you, Savannah, what did you make of her? I want to go ahead and apologize for the background noise. My grandfather's listening to TV and he's half deaf. <laughs> Um, but honestly, if I'm correct on the character, Lady Macbeth is the one that conversed with Macbeth to try to kill the king or mm -hmm. to kill the king, correct? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> honestly, I found her character very empowering, definitely as a woman, but also very manipulative. The I guess play that I watched. I watched one on YouTube or a couple different ones. But the one that I watched, she came off very much manipulative and conniving. And honestly, she kind of reminded me of like the snake from Adam and Eve that's like, hey, eat this apple, da -da -da, whatever. And she's like, hey, if you kill him, we can have our lives together. We can live how we want. And I like this play on that fact because you always got to love a good evil character in my eyes. But aside from that, I'll be honest, I didn't get drawn into it too much aside from the uh, witches. The play that I've seen showed them to be kind of like very gross lingering I don't know just very creepy crawly to get under your skin and I found it funny because I'm a Norse pagan and that's how witches and stuff come off in our generation today even and it just cracks me up so yeah, that, that's interesting uh, it's an interesting observation to make so usually I see um the witches are like overly seductive whenever I see productions of Beth. I don't really see them as the I'll end. have to send you the play link that I watched because they like had them. What is the woman? You remember the colored lady on Pirates of Caribbean, the witch that if you don't want it, I'll take it back. Yeah. It, they showed and perceived her as that the three like the play I watched had them basically in a swamp just looked like raggedy clothing dreadlocks just like they had been muddy playing in the dirt kind of ordeal not so much seductive just worshiping of Macbeth yeah usually I see it when I see it they make the witches like overly hot so um, Macbeth can't help but be drawn in and listen to him. There was actually a really weird 
film version of this, 1971, Playboy uh, produced it. That's almost like a Macbeth porno. Um, it's, direct, <laughs> it's directed by Roman Polanski, uh, who a uh, very famous director. Didn't did I tell you guys about Polanski last class? He directed Chinatown. Yeah. You know, Polanski made this version of Beth. I've never seen it, but I know about it. I've read about it. The Savannah, I like I liked your point about uh, Lady Beth. Um, yeah, she is kind of one of the first great instances in literature of what we now call the femme fatale, the femme fatale. That's a French term, femme, F-E-M-M-E, fatale, F-A-T-A-L-E. That means dangerous woman, right? Dangerous woman. This is a trope that we see in, in movies. The dangerous woman, a lot of the detective movies from like the 1940s, 1950s played on this trope. But it's usually this, this type of um, yeah, yeah, that, that would be a good tattoo, Savannah. You know, film fatale. But it's it's this trope that you often see, especially if you like watch a lot of these old detective movies. If you guys take movie class with me, you'll we'll watch a bunch of these. But um, usually in these old detective movies, you would see some woman who is very pretty, very seductive. She usually like draws the uh, detective into like some type of trap using her seduction techniques. And then a film fatale is often compared to like a black widow spider. Black widow spiders will eat their mates after uh, after they've after they reproduce. So um, yeah, Lady Lady Macbeth is often is very much a very er, a really early origin. This type of character, like a woman who is so good at seduction. Not just seduction of sex, but seduction of words. Right? She's got some very powerful rhetoric in the play to convince Macbeth to turn bad. Um, but yeah, she's like a black widow spider luring her prey into the web. That's what a femme fatale character is. Can you guys think of movies, uh, instances from movies where you might... Uh, can you guys think of a specific movie where you might have seen a character like that? Faith, you're uh, you're dressed up like Walter White, um, Jesse's girlfriend Jane in Breaking Bad. She's kind of that femme fatale um, archetype. And she like usually they're dark haired, um, and, and she she has something she has something in common with that um, character trope. In Marvel, right, we have Black Widow. Um, yeah, we have we have that character. That's kind of a they make it. They make it kind of obvious with that character. Um, yeah, lots of examples. We'll, we'll ground ourselves a little in the text here in a minute um, to break her character down. She's one of the great high points of this play, I think. Um, Faith, what a what about you? Do you have anything to add on to uh, all this we've been discussing so far? I don't think I have much else to say that's already been, that, well, that's not already been said already. But um, 
I wasn't too fond of the play. I don't know. It just didn't grasp my head all that well, shockingly, since it's so notorious. Yeah, it's, it's not my favorite Shakespeare play either, frankly. I'm kind of with Daryl when I'm, I'm more on the Hamlet camp. But uh, nevertheless, it's, it's a good one to kind of explore, especially around this time of the year. Lily, we'll end with you here. Um, what, what's your thoughts? I saw you un unmute there, Lily, but I can't hear you if you're saying anything. Can any of you guys hear? Um, more of a Hamlet person yourself, Lily. Yeah, I think um, I think the biggest difference is character, right? There's a lot more psychology in, in Hamlet. I think you could argue, especially with all that stuff with Oedipus, Oedipal tensions and all that. Well, let's, let's ground ourselves in, in the text. Um, also, I wanted to ask you guys this question before we dive in. Um, I didn't use that text that sent you guys, but I'm guessing that's what most of you used for that PDF. How how did how did the PDF go? Was it a pretty good? Um, did it give you good guys good notes, good explanations of the words? Josh, you probably used it the most, seeing how you presented. Was, did you find it adequate? Yes. Uh... It it was it was a very very good good PDF. I'm glad that you uh, sent it to us. I also used it for uh, obviously I used it for the presentation because you know I need a source, so that's the one I'm going to use. Very good. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad I dug it up. Um, I asked an old professor of mine. He knew of a good one, and he didn't. I just happened to randomly discover that one googling so i'm glad it was useful yeah that's it's kind of hard i'm sure you listen to it as well josh you, you always mention how you listen to them yes i listen to it while i read it you know just so i can fully absorb it, it it's kind of hard for me to read to uh read things you know i i'm autistic because so uh i kind of have a hard time uh, reading things on their own, so I need some sort of a audible thing to facilitate that. Do you do that too, Savannah? Listen as you uh, as you read. Yeah, because not gonna lie, I also have a touch of autism. So it's very smaller on the spectrum like it's functioning but it does help a lot because I have a, a touch of dyslexia so it's kind of hard for me to focus in on it and that's why my first play I ditched on because I had a very very hard time with reading it. Well, I'm glad you did ditch on the first one Savannah because you gave a good presentation on the Duchess that was the play you were meant to do. Thank you. Yeah, good. I still haven't watched that Denzel Washington Macbeth yet. I know it's on Apple TV. I might uh, watch it over the next couple of days now that the play's fresh in my mind again. Uh, I've heard it's good. But um, before we dive into Josh's questions, let's explore the text a little bit. Uh, one to five is where I want to go to first. One to five, Act One, Scene Five. 
think this is when she gives her great speech. Yeah. Yeah, Josh mentioned one three as being a having a really good um, passage too. I think I actually I sent you guys right before class. I dug up an old paper I wrote about Macbeth when I was in grad school. I talked about how Macbeth I talked about the theme of time in Macbeth. You know, there's lots of mentions of time, the past, the present, the future. Um, temporality that, that's a big philosophy kind of thing um, i talked about how macbeth was probably inspired by saint augustine's confessions so um do you guys want to i wrote that really early in my doctorate program so it's probably not my best writing but uh, i figured i would send it to you just for kicks, just so you can kind of see what I wrote about the what I wrote about the play like ten years ago. But uh, I didn't publish it or anything. It's just a random paper I wrote years ago that was sitting on the hard drive. Maybe I should. I read it again, and this is actually I was actually onto something. But um, one five line. 38, this is when Lady Macbeth really sets the tone for her character. I have to, I have to go, anytime we cover Shakespeare, you got to go over the big soliloquies. This one and tomorrow, 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 I definitely want to go over with you guys. This one, she says, give him tending, he brings great news. The raven himself is hoarse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. What, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pale thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, hold, hold. Great Lama's worthy call to order, greater than both by the all hell how hereafter thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present. I now feel the future in the instant. I just mentioned time. There's 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 a mention of time in that speech. But um, this is whenever whenever we're talking about femininity, I ask Savannah what she called. And this is this is the passage where Lady Macbeth says the hell with women with femininity. Right? Um, unsex, she says, unsex me here. Make she pretty much says uh, throw away, it's time to throw away my gender identity. Right? I can't have, women back then, of course, were known for being. Uh, more passionate than men. Women are guided by emotions. Men are guided by logic and reason. We we can debate that all day whether that's actually true, but that's how they saw it. That that's how they saw it. So she is saying here, throw away all of my womanly instincts, right? Throw away my especially motherly instincts. She says, make my breast milk venom. Um, so she, she, this is a pretty hardcore speech, right? Where she's kind of like, yeah, all right. To head to hell with gender norms. Right? I'm, I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna be something else, something different. Um, now that I drew your guys' attention to that particular speech, um, what does this do? for your understanding 
of her character. I said film a pal a minute ago. Um, would you were you guys like hell yeah right or were you guys like oh this lady uh, she's kind of crazy. Um, how how are you guys feeling about her? Yeah, I do think she's uh, kind of, you know, going off the deep end. Well, the uh, well, first of all, the context of that of of her doing that is because she she want she wants Macbeth to go, you know, kill the king so they so they can both have the throne. So so yeah, that is pretty pretty psychotic. Yeah, this is before Macbeth really even does anything wrong. She's she's the one who kind of goads him into it. Macbeth doesn't really even finish the job either, right? She actually goes in and finishes the job because he doesn't have the guts to do it. Kira, what do you make of uh, of of this speech? Um. I have so much going on in my brain right now. <laughs> it's kind of mixed. Because, like, she, I don't know, because she ended up having to do it anyways. So, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. My brain is scrambled right now. Yeah, Macbeth was kind of a wimp, right? He, he, couldn't, he couldn't see it through. So, she, she ended up having being the one to actually get her hands dirty, so to speak. She has that other great speech where she says, "Wash off my, wash off my hands of all this blood from uh, Duncan." Yeah, the pen. You guys could read this in a couple of different ways. Um, psychotic, sure. Um, Example of feminism gone wrong, maybe. Um, this this was a time period where they like to show these types of like feminist characters. And they like to kind of show you the dangers of feminism, like so. This is a, this is a character that might be made monstrous through her desire to uh, be more equitable. With men, she wears the pants in the in this relationship. I think it's probably a safe assumption to say. Um, Faith, what about you? What do you what do you make of uh, this speech? I thought she served with that speech. Like honestly, I would use the breast milk line in my own day-to-day -day life <laughs> yeah you need to get yourself a magnet and put it on your on your refrigerator right they actually do make shakespeare magnets with quotes from these plays that that would be magnet worthy i think Savannah, what about you? Do, you? do you see this, especially now that I grounded you in the text a little bit, do you see this as more monstrous uh, feminism gone wrong? Is this kind of like what men use to kind of defame what to say, hey, feminism's wrong? Is, it, is this kind of what are you following with what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, honestly, <laughs> As you was reading off her quote, I was sitting here like, yeah, that basically sums up feminism. <laughs> take, take this away from me. Make me basically a man. I hate to say it, but I'm with faith on the breast milk is venom. <laughs> I would use that in my day to day. Absolutely. Just for the simple fact of it gives her that power not only in her mind but it's showing that hey i'm not just 
a bimbo of a character, I'm going to show you that I have power behind my anger and what have you. So honestly, I enjoyed the speech out of any of our um, readings that we have done so far. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of quotable stuff on there. This, uh, this is kind of refreshing. Like when we talked about Hamlet, we talked about Ophelia and how Ophelia wasn't really um, fleshed out. It seems like Shakespeare learned his lesson a little by the time he got to this. She's a, she's a very well-rounded. Of all of his female characters, especially in his tragedies, this one's probably the most well-developed. Sometimes you make the argument men can't write women, right? That's all. That's often an argument. Like men have a hard time. Male authors have a hard time writing women characters. Well, uh, this is this is Shakespeare after he's perhaps wrote a lot of them. This is play close to the end of his life. Yeah, Lily gets a good comment and she just typed in the box. She says she kind of reminds me of Medea. She goes all the way crazy. Okay. Um, pro probably the, I would maybe even argue she's a little more evil than Medea. Okay. Medea acts out of revenge. Uh, Lady Macbeth acts, does all this out of sheer ambition. Yeah, you, you agree. You agree, uh, Lily, that she's, she's more evil. Josh, you too. Yeah, we, we had a great debate when we talked about Medea, that she's sympathetic or not. Maybe there's some sympathy to be had for Lady Macbeth the further we go through the play. This is her at her most um, poignant, I guess is, that's probably the best word. As the play goes on, guilt comes into play. And guilt. They always they always like to make mention like the term Catholic guilt, right? That um, he sinned, carry the guilt around until you have to go to confession. Right? The guilt, Lady Macbeth, the guilt kind of drives both not only her but also Macbeth himself. It seems to drive both of them a little crazy. As the play goes on, she's seen sleepwalking pretty close to the end. She's sleepwalking and admitting her faults for what she's done. So her subconscious is tortured by all the things she's she's done. So there is there is some remorse here. Like we can argue, like is she a damned soul or not? Probably, right? She doesn't, she never, she feels guilt, but she never repents. Right? So, most likely. Um, also, wanted to mention the other great soliloquy in the play. This is close to the end. Then we'll move into Josh's questions. Close to the end, Act Five, Scene Five. This is the other great one. Five five. Let's see. Five five line sixteen or seventeen. This is right after Lady Macbeth has been announced as dying off screen. She doesn't. She doesn't have an on stage death. She dies off stage. But um, the other great soliloquy of the play. One of the things about Macbeth, one of the themes about it, this is probably the darkest, most nihilistic play we've probably read in this class. It's fairly dark, really pessimistic, very dreary. Right? There's not a lot of hope to be found in this world. Except maybe the hope that one day a great king, King James, will ascend, as Josh said. 
there's not a lot there's not a lot of hope to be found Macbeth is completely nihilistic he's kind of rejected the meaning of anything good imagine getting to a place in your life where you do get completely nihilistic right? you're so cynical that you don't believe in anything anymore you don't believe in law and order you don't believe in god you don't believe in anything really everything is just meaningless but so that's kind of um, what macbeth is going with with his speech if you guys study literature um, literature after world war one a great period of literature called modernism you, like you have writers like Ernest Hemingway, James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, um, William Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, lots of those great writers from this time period. Only then do you see a nihilism that kind of matches what Macbeth is doing. You know, think about it like that. All those writers saw World War One, World War Two. They saw all the nasty things that humans could do to each other. So a lot of those writers um, wrote about, or were also equally nihilistic. One of the great American novels by a guy, by William Faulkner, from the great writer from Mississippi, one of the greatest American novels is called The Sound and the Fury. Okay, The Sound and the Fury. So I'm going to read the speech. You'll you'll see where Faulkner got his title from. Um, Macbeth says she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It, life, is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. That's, that's, that's the great zinger of the play. Life is but a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing so um that's that's Shakespeare, that's Macbeth's great metaphor for life yeah by idiot he means um, they're they're literally talking about someone who's we're not talking about well like that guy's an idiot like they're saying the guy's mentally mentally uh, not there life is but a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing of course that's where faulkner got his title the sound and the fury um, pretty pessimistic outlook on life right I, I'm, I don't know if any of you guys in here would consider yourselves nihilists some of you guys in here are kind of cynics i don't know if any of you guys would go as far as to call call yourself a nihilist <laughs> Like you reject everything. Yeah, I, th I think it's fair to say some of you guys are cynics, which which is absolutely fine. There's a difference of cynics and nihilists. What do you guys What do you guys think of this? This is this is real dark, depressing stuff, right? Uh, were any of you guys kind of struck by that? Kind of just like how bleak and hopeless this world is there doesn't seem to be any chance to do good in this world it's kind of a nasty awful place daryl I'm, I'm i'm looking at you what did you what did you make of this this thing of nihilism I'm not really too sure what to think about it. I don't. I don't think that I would consider myself one, but I don't. I don't really um, know really what to say about it. I, I I think the details you added to it covered it pretty well and said really the majority of what needed to be said. 
Josh, you would not consider yourself a nihilist. No, I would not. Right. Uh, I, I'm a Christian, which mm -hmm. means uh, I believe that one day this uh, world's going to be restored and and there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. So as such, I I obviously don't believe that this this world's meaningless. That now, as for uh, the play itself, I would say that uh, the uh, play itself is obviously signified by the uh, the uh, the uh, for, the uh, dwindling fortunes of uh, Macbeth, because you know everything's going wrong. There's one prophecy that went fulfilled that he didn't think would be fulfilled, and now and now Milady and now her uh, and now his wife is dead. So he's kind of like, uh, this yeah, things are getting pretty bad. Yeah, Macbeth has to believe, he kind of has to believe in something, right, in order to even accept the witch's prophecy is holding any weight. So, calling him a nihilist, he, he does believe in something, um, otherwise he wouldn't believe in fate. So, um, maybe that's the moment he completely does become a nihilist. Up, up to that point, he he seems like he's a little over overweening on his idea of fate. But yeah, J Josh, I agree with you. I, I'm not a nihilist either, right? For, for the same reasons. Um, yeah, I. I would say, Kira and Faith, I would say you two are probably the, the cynics of the class. Uh, you're, I think I would consider you guys kind of cynical sometimes, but I wouldn't call you nihilists. Um, cynic, cynicism's good. It's a quality I admire, right? I mean, I just kind of live life like, mm -hmm. I don't, <laughs> like there's certain things, I don't think that, I'm gonna go to like hell or anything. I think when you die, you just go wherever, man. Like wherever mm -hmm. your soul, if your soul was good or if it was bad, I just, I just live life. Cause like, what happens after mm -hmm. death? I'll worry about that when I die. Right. Yeah, I, I don't mean cynical in a bad way. I kind of mean like a, you know, like you just kind of roll your eyes up at the world sometimes i guess that's that's a good thing i think i can yeah. definitely say that faith is very much like that, <laughs> that <laughs> me and faith have a lot in common that, but that is one thing that we're just kind of like eh, with everything well josh uh, let's dive into your questions now if you want, if you don't mind resharing see if there's anything we haven't addressed all right i'll go ahead and share the screen let me make sure it's work everything's working uh, give me a second just need to pull everything up all right so uh Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. Oh, you're fine. We're not in any hurry. All right. Can you everybody see what I'm seeing? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Cool. All right. So for our first question, how responsible is Macbeth for his actions? Did he commit his acts of treachery and tyranny out of his own free will, or was he coerced by outside influence, by fate? which is and or the and or Lady Macbeth. Basically what I'm asking is, would he have made the same decision had he not had those other influences? I'll start here. Um, I think that um, I would argue here, no. I do think he's influenced by something perhaps greater. Um, that's, that's just my hunch. Like, if Lady, if Lady Macbeth would, if he wouldn't have heard that prophecy, I don't even know if his mind would have went there. Um, 
So the, between the prophecy and his wife, I think that kind of really sets him on a on a bad path. Um, you, know, you guys got to keep in mind too. This is we talked a lot about Christianity for a reason because it dominates this time period. This is um, you can kind of read the the idea of Calvinism into this play, right? Calvinism, God predestined stuff, right? Everything's predestined. So um, the world, this world, kind of feels like that to me, right? This is a world where Macbeth's fate is perhaps predestined. I would argue the witches are telling the truth the whole time. Like the witches do have some kind of like keen eye into the future. And they're just not, um, they're not just kind of BSing Macbeth and telling him riddles. You guys are free to disagree with me. Um, that's always kind of how I've read the play. It's this sort of fatalistic story. Macbeth, this is, Again, we're talking about tragedy. When we talked about tragedy before, um, we talked about Medea. Like Medea was kind of an awful character. So it's the play of tragedy. Um, I remember you did your paper on that, Josh. Um, same thing for Macbeth. Macbeth is an awful character. So how is this a tragedy? This is kind of an extension off, off of your question, Josh. I would say it's it's a tragedy because he's not responsible. Things happen because of fate. But um, you guys are free to tell him I'm full of crap. Right? He is. You don't murder somebody unless you choose to do it. Right? That's that's probably the best counter argument to what I just said. Is that I see a nod in faith? Is that is that uh, is that what you would argue? I mean, yeah, he did chose to kill someone, but this could also be taken the same way that um, Oedipus the King was taken with the conversation with fate, the um, own actions. I don't know how to word that. Anyway, um, I do feel like, yeah, it could have been fate, but if we were to take these people out I feel like maybe he would still make some of the decisions yeah that's um I see what I see exactly what you're saying Faith because if you remember in Oedipus he still murdered his father um, so in a way he fulfilled the prophecy that way like if he wouldn't have murdered a guy he wouldn't have fulfilled the prophecy right same kind of that's kind of what you're saying here. Daryl, what would your answer be to this question? Fate, or did he bring it on himself? I think that in the first instance of him killing the king, I think that it was outside sources, like his mainly his his wife, Lady Macbeth, really convincing him to do so, and you know begging him and pleading him, and you know just trying to manipulate him almost. Um, maybe the witch's prophecy had something to do with it, but I think that as time went on and he was ordering for other people to be killed that he thought would take him out of power, it was sort of getting to his head and making him make those decisions so maybe at the start he was you know in good mind and he wasn't trying to make these bad decisions but as as time went on you know the the lady Macbeth had killed herself and you know she wasn't exactly an excuse for him anymore but yet he kept feeling bad to try to hold his title of king very very well said um after a while of killing, you, know, you, you got to stop making excuses. Um, yeah, he it's kind of like, um, kind of like even in Hamlet, right? Macbeth and Claudius are both similar types of characters. Claudius is like, how can I repent as long as uh, 
I'm still enjoying the fruits of my sin. Right? He says that in his speech when Hamlet's getting ready to stab him. Same kind of thing with Macbeth, right? I like, I like to make these random connections. Kira, what about you? What's your answer? Fate, or did he do it himself? Um, I think it was fate, because, like, you can't really get out of that. Like, if it's, like, the prophecy, like, you can't really, there's not much you can do about it. Right. Maybe if he didn't, this would turn out to be like a Greek tragedy, right? Where he would still do it even when trying not to. Faith, I saw you unmute. Um, I don't know. I think killing someone could be easily avoided. Right. Yeah. He could just be the king's loyal. Um, Thane, right? He could just be his thane, just uh, enjoy being rich, right? owning all that land. But no, he, he has to choose to kill. Josh, how would you answer your own question there? I would say this. I do think he was driven along by fate but here's 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 the thing i'm going to add to this i don't think that in of itself justifies what he did like for instance if i uh if i if i give a if i have a prophecy that uh i predict that's that uh bob is going to is going to uh do something really bad and then uh and then uh, Bob goes goes and does that bad thing. Then, uh, then uh, is it really the is it really the fault of fate that that person go, went and did it, or is it just because that guy is doing a bad thing? That's that's my thoughts on it. Now this. Uh... This discussion is reminding me of the new Black Adam movie, right? Doctor, the character of Dr. Fate. Good movie, by the way. Good movie. I like your second question here, too, Josh. Moving on the long. Did Malcolm and Donald Bain make the right decision when they fled after their father's murder? Um, if they wouldn't have fled, um, they would have, they kind of were blamed for it at first. Like they're the murderers. They left town, right? They, they looked guilty. But, um, Pays off for him, right? Public opinion turns against Macbeth, and um, they kind of ride back in as the legitimate heirs. They're not pretenders, like like you mentioned, Josh. Divine right, right? This this idea that kings have a divine right to rule, mandated by God. Like Malcolm has the divine right that uh, Macbeth doesn't. So he's able to kind of ride in like a white knight at the end and reclaim it. So uh, I, guess, I guess I'm talking aloud here, but that's how I would answer your, your question. It would, they did. Otherwise, they'd have probably got re real early on. It's probably smart to bail out of town. The play kind of suffers from that, though, I think. Like, dramatically, Malcolm would have been there the whole time, and there's more conflict in the middle part of the play. I feel like the play would be better. Like, Malcolm kind of is at the beginning, and he kind of shows up again at the end. Um, there's a lot, there's a little bit of 
unevenness in the, in the structure of the play. So um, it makes sense, but dramatically, I wish you would have done it different. I guess, I guess that's how I would answer your point there. I don't know, any of the rest of you guys want to chime in on, on that one? Good call, or do you guys agree with me? It would have been better if we'd have had more conflict between the two. You think so, Faith? Yeah, rather than him just showing up at the end, being the this white knight here, right? More, more conflict. What about question three? It's Halloween. Let's talk about some. What's the day after Halloween? It still counts. Why not? I've still I've got my pumpkin. It, uh, it's uh, All Saints Eve, I believe. Yeah. Also, yeah. Th today's All Saints Day in the in the Catholic Church. Right. That's that's what the uh, holiday Halloween's named after. I've, I've still got my pumpkin mug. So. Um, Let's talk about some witches. So were the witches a force of, for evil or merely a neutral party? So Savannah, Savannah touched on this earlier, right? That they're in the version she watched, the witches are kind of seen as like Wizard of Oz type witches, right? Probably they're probably like green and ghastly and haggard. Um Remember that we're talking about the early 17th century. What happened? Think about what happened. So persecution of witches had already started in, in England. The Calvinists especially like saw random women and persecuted them. But when they came to America, everybody knows what happened. Um, all these ladies, a lot of these, most of these ladies were innocent. Um, these people just kind of read these random superstitious things and put them as as being um, premonitions. So they persecuted a lot of these women in, in like Salem and stuff. In the, it's 60 years after this play was written, in the 1660s, going into the early 1700s, the, the Salem witch trials lasted a while. Um, But how we perceive witches and how the play treats them is a different question, I guess. Um, do you guys believe that the witches knew fate in the play? Well, do, you, do you believe they had some type of supernatural power? Or um, were they just merely neutral, as Josh says? They talk to they they talk to um, Hecate a couple of times. I mean, Hecate is uh, is um, well, she's kind of the I know I know what she is. So it's slipping my tongue though. She's like the she's like the OG witch, right? So they they keep invoking Hecate throughout the play. Savannah, I'll turn to you. You said you said this was a part of the play that really intrigued you. Um, are they neutral or are they evil in the play? Honestly, I feel like they're evil in a sense because they do uh, convince him to go along with it. I feel like they're just portrayed as evil anyways. They're supposed to be evil because they're witches and they're manipulative and such as that. Um, I want to go ahead and put them in the evil party. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I don't know how I would define them. Um, if I was going to answer that, 
depends how you answer the first question, right? Like if you believe that Macbeth was responsible for his own actions, then uh, the witches are merely neutral. If you believe that um, Macbeth was coerced by fate, maybe they're a force for evil. Or maybe if it's because of fate, maybe it's because maybe they are still neutral, right? Because they're just the spokesperson for fate. So it's a, lots of ways you could um, interpret that. I think for Shakespeare's audience, we're I think in a way we're kind of kind of bring a modern spin on this question though. For Shakespeare's audience. In 1607, they would have definitely seen the witches as as evil and bad guys, you know, bad ladies, I should say. You know, there's a I think they would have definitely seen it that way. Lots of paranoia about them. One of my favorite horror films is Robert Eggers's The Witch from like 2015. Have you guys seen that one? I hate that movie. You don't like that movie? No, it scared me. <laughs> it was, I like disturbing movies. Don't get me wrong. But that one, I don't even think I understood it. Because I, don't even get me started. <laughs> yeah, that movie drowns you in 17th century New England. And all the paranoia about witches. And all the like signs that they saw and random stuff. You, it's, it's a good one to go watch if you, if you want a good horror movie. It's not too violent. It's not too violent or anything like that. It's more or less just disturbing. Um, great, great film. Next time I teach film class, I'm going to teach that movie. I, think, I haven't taught it before. I hope I don't get you a movie class because I do not want to watch that movie again. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I won't hear it. I'm, I'm tempted to put it on there. We'll, we'll see. It wasn't a bad movie. Don't get me wrong. But it definitely... Mm. See, and I like like those witchy movies and stuff like you know, Blair Witch and all that type of stuff. I don't know. I think I just found it like really unsettling. Like the, um, I don't know if you ever watched it, but The Ritual, which is on Netflix. I watched that and it's not even scary. It just, it was like uneasy. And like Faith in me watched Sinister and it wasn't that it was scary. It was just like eerie and uneasy. And I think that's what, that's what bothers me about that movie is like, it's eerie. See, that's, that's the type of horror I like to hear that the kind that gets in your mind and isn't just making you jump. I, I love psychological horror, but that was, I don't think, I, for me, I did not classify it as psychological horror. I classified it as, I'm not watching that again. <laughs> Once is enough. Eggers and his other great movie is The Lighthouse with Robert Pattinson and Will and the Foe. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have seen that one, but that's a good one too. Robert Pattinson puts in a great performance in that movie. He deserves some awards. Daryl, I will throw a question for you. Um, same question as as, as Hamlet, so, with, with Banquo in this case, was Banquo's ghost real or a mere hallucination? When I was comparing the two earlier, I'd forgot all about the ghost. That's another similarity they have, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, I think with Hamlet, I said that I did think the ghost was real because multiple characters had seen it, and they um. You know, he was correct about the killing of his father. I, I can see how people would see the other way and think, well, maybe Hamlet just knew 
that his dad was killed by his uncle and he just sort of didn't want to accept it so he made up the ghost but with this one i'm not too sure because i don't remember anyone else seeing it but Macbeth. but i could be wrong about that so maybe this one is just like a figment of imagination that's caused by all the guilt he holds that, that's like trying to get him to stop what he's doing or get him to realize his actions again i i could be wrong about that someone else might have seen the ghost and Macbeth just um so maybe there is a chance that it's real but i don't remember anyone else but but Macbeth like acknowledging it and seeing it so i do feel like this one is more of a uh an imagination thing especially since it didn't really say anything that proved it it was real like saying something that'll happen in the future like the witches did i feel like the witches can tell the tell the future because everything did come true but i don't think that this spirit was real but i think the hamlet one was i think it's well said daryl um i think i agree with you i don't think anybody else saw it either i read it earlier today again or but um from what I recall, no one else saw it. It was just from bed. That's when he was kind of going crazy and saying random weird stuff. And everybody's like, dude, this guy's snapping. Um, um, some good old Catholic guilt coming out, right, for, for what he has done. Josh, did you... Uh, Read it kind of similar to Daryl. Uh, I did, I did, I did read it as you know, just a, just a uh, manifestation of his, uh, of his uh, guilt, at least on a subconscious level, at least. Yeah, uh, there's. I think there's some consensus on this question that. Um, more or less psychological instead of a literal theme like in Hamlet. Of course, with, with Hamlet, there's always that debate. Was it real or, or uh, psychological? I didn't tell you guys what I thought about Hamlet, but I've always kind of been more on the psychological side with that. A lot of you guys argued it's real. I, I like to think it's more psychological. Maybe that's just how I interpret the play. I don't I don't often like to reveal my thoughts um, in teaching. Yeah, I feel like that's a good that's a good end cap. So uh, yeah, good discussion guys. This was my first time teaching the play and Josh made it easy. He gave us so much good stuff that uh, made it easy for me to kind of shepherd you along so great job josh great job all of you guys have done fantastic with your presentation i've been very pleased so um let me exit that out so next week we're taking a turn again we're going to go into the 18th century we're going to read a play called Tartuffe. It's from a French writer named Molier. Molier was a writer in a time period called the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment, the Enlightenment was this kind of like time period where they rejected faith. Um, not, yeah, they rejected faith in more instead of more for reason than science. And this was the great age of science, the late 18th century. So you, this is when people like Isaac Newton um, was, Isaac Newton, Copernicus, all these people were living um, in this time period. New, Newton was, I think Copernicus might have been a few years earlier, but this was the age where all these great scientists were springing up. So this is a time period Whenever you think about the American Revolution, for instance, like Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, all those guys were products of the Enlightenment. 
So we'll talk a lot more about that next week. But, um, yeah, the, the play part two, just to give you a preview, it's about um, this family. You have this random, This it's definitely a, it's definitely a riff on Catholicism, but you see, you have this guy named Tartuffe who's kind of a fake, uh, righteous guy. He's fake. He's a big fake. And the whole place just a bunch of laughs about how the family can't really get that he's fake. So it's a big, it's a big satire. It's a witty, really witty play. It's a satire. Um, we should have plenty to discuss with it. It's, a, it's something different than what we've been doing in the past few weeks. It's a nice mix up. The French, the French aren't as mannerly as the English. Like the French are known for being a little looser in their literature, which uh, Daryl and Lily, you guys will find that out in a couple of weeks in the other class when you read Madame Bovary. Like the French are a little more daring than uh, than the English. So uh, Faith will be our presenter next week. So she will be shepherding us through the platform. So any final thoughts, questions, comments before we depart? Okay, so again, remember guys to uh, before next Monday, Get your papers in on Brightspace. Again, if you want me to look over it early, I'll be happy to. And uh, next next week, I will have designed a couple more of those grammar quizzes. What I'll do for those, I'll give them you to the very end of the semester to do them. Okay. So there's a couple more left. I feel like we need to do. Then we'll call it quits on that. I just want to ask one more final question. Um, I covered the final paper last week. Are any of you guys maybe gravitating to a topic for that yet? Maybe, because remember, it's about a famous speech in one of these plays. Um, have any of you guys like thought, yeah, I want to do that? And are any of you guys in that boat yet? I'm uh, leaning toward the uh, tomorrow speech. That would be a good one. Yeah, that, that would definitely be a good one. I saw your comment, Lily. I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that. Um, you say you read it in high school. So I'm glad that we broke it down better than the high school classroom did. I didn't read this one in high school. I didn't read this one until I went to college. Yeah, just, just keep thinking about it. Like we've got a few more plays left to do, but if you really if we, we ever discuss a speech in class that you really kind of gravitate to, it might be a good paper idea. So just keep it in the back of your mind. Last week's class I have uploaded to Brightspace too. So uh, if you remember the first half of the class, I talked about short paper two. Second half of the class last week, I talked about the final paper. So if you want to go back and hear my explanation again, I uploaded that earlier today, and you should be able to find it. So again, wonderful class, guys. I appreciate you, you all. I had a tough day today. Uh, in my other school, I teach a bunch of writing classes. Nobody showed up to class. I guess this was the day after Halloween. Probably everybody's hung over, so I was kind of in a bad mood. So you could you guys lifted me out of it. So so good job. Good job. So um I'll see you guys next week for part two. And I will look forward to reading your papers as soon as you submit them. 
and I will I will see you guys next week. Thank you for class. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye, everybody. Good night. Night.